All right, welcome to the Crow Discovery Project. I was able to actually get out the telescope on the night of the 11th and shoot. And the following day it was rain, and today we had perfectly blue skies. And of course the chem plane sh showed up, which they do almost every time we have perfectly blue skies. Uh, they started in at about noon, and 10 minutes ago I was out looking to see if I could shoot the moon tonight. And of course the moon is not even visible. It is completely milky white e everywhere. As you can see from these images, the trees are beginning to leaf out. Um, so finally, we're getting past winter. And uh, I took out the camera and shot some birds here that have a nest and a tree in the yard uh, so that I could clean the sensor and tune things in uh, in preparation for uh, telescope work. Um, here in Rhode Island, the chem planes are horrible. Um, this is the night of the 11th. I'm shooting the moon before it's dark here. And as I was shooting, I was amazed because it was the first day that we had had in a long time where there was no spraying going on. All day long I didn't see any spraying. Well, maybe early in the day there was a little bit, but not enough to mess things up. And then I saw a chem plane um, coming in view. So I swung the scope over and I'll show you some images of that. What happens here in Rhode Island is these planes go from east to west and west to east and they shoot over the ecliptic or the apparent path of the sun and the moon and it blocks my ability to shoot both the sun and the moon. Um, for people who have used telescopes, they know this is really, really difficult to track a moving object. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I have figured out that if the scope is lined up so that the forks are parallel to the chem plane, I can film them for as long as I can see them. But this guy was going across... Um, so it's, it's just a difficult angle to try to get them. It's a bit like when people try to track the ISS or the light we call the ISS with a handheld scope. Um, you're lucky if you get it in frame for a couple seconds. And even just doing that demonstrates that the people have some skill slewing the scope. But anyhow, here's what we see all the time. What you're looking at here is kind of not very persistent trails. They last for about 10, maybe 15 minutes, and then they give the sky a shiny appearance. Um, this guy was about mid-level, although he was quite a ways away from me. Again, this was shot with the telescope. <clears throat> it's un unbelievable to me that people here where the sky is so clean and so blue, uh, like today where there was not a cloud in the sky until noon and then these jokers showed up uh, and now you can't see a thing. I just don't understand how people don't put A and B together and understand what's going on here. But anyhow, I'll run a couple more minutes of this chem plane and we'll do a still because I know some people like to try to identify um, the planes. And actually, this one's pretty identifiable. I don't even bother anymore. But I will be doing probably a lot more chemtrail work here shortly because it is just so blatant what they do. And when I was here in August before I had moved, um, there were quite a few orbs around these guys. Anyhow, here's a still from the video of this, uh, this Joker spraying crap in the skies. So I'm going to cover Jupiter, and I'm going to cover a defocusing test on stars. Um, and I'll explain to you why I do this, and it does link. It is a piece of the evidence uh, that led me to announce that I believe space is likely liquid. So we'll start out here with the moon later at night after it was dark. Uh, here we go. The seeing was really, really good. Um, you can see a little bit of turbulence in the air. Uh, that is because it's still cooling down quite a bit at night, and this was a very warm day. But nonetheless, this is not a bad view at all, and there is next to no light pollution where I am, and there's very little air pollution other than the chem planes. So here in a second, I'll spin off, and we will take a look at Jupiter. Mars and Saturn would have been rising three, four hours later, but it was getting very kind of misty and cloudy uh, as they were clearing the horizon. So I ended up packing up because the scope lens just gets too wet. Here we go. All right, here's a shot of the light we call Jupiter, and it is way overexposed so that you can see what we call the moons there. Supposedly that is Ganymede, Io, Callisto, um, you know, the ones that everyone are familiar with, Europa. So here I'm cranking down the exposure, and so when it's overexposed, you can easily see the moon. Some cameras can show what I'm about to show you on the disc and get the moons in the same shot. It's a tough thing to do. you got to have the right setup. So there it is with the exposure, exposure adjusted, and you can begin to see the bands. 
the first thing I did this night was do some defocusing and overfocusing on uh, Jupiter. But I watched it for, I don't know, at least an hour. I was working on Jupiter, doing all kinds of things, changing the settings, um, changing the exposure, exposure, changing the auto lighting settings, turning off everything so everything was manual. Um, when you do stuff like this, this is how you find interesting things. So I'm going to change the clip here. There we go. Um, so there's Jupiter with all the settings pulled off and I am over focusing and uh, I will defocus in a minute. When we get over to the star test, you'll see uh, what the difference is. So normally if you pick a star or something like that and you pull it way out of focus with a telescope, it looks like a donut. There's a light with a hole in the center. This is one way you can test what's called collimation of your telescope to ensure that it can focus as good as it can focus. If the hole in the center um, from the defocusing or overfocusing is equidistant from the edges, in other words, it looks like a perfect donut, then you know your scope is collimated. It's one of the tests you can do. And there you see the hole opening up and you can tell that the scope is collimated. So it has the ability to gain a per perfect focus, basically. The optics are set correctly, they don't need adjustment. So you start to get the sense of the reason that I do the defocusing and overfocusing tests. It almost looks like you're looking through water here. Now unfortunately there is no magnification on this. I just have the camera straight to the telescope. When I get the eyepiece system set up and I have it so it's camera eyepiece telescope or in other words I would be magnifying anywhere from three to four almost 500 times um, you get a much sharper image and you get a much sharper sense of what I'm going to show you with the star. You can see the moons on the left there kind of poking into view, in and out of view as I, as I hit the apex focus. So now I'm defocusing, which means I'm going shallow before I was over focusing. And you'll see why this makes a difference in a second when I get over to the star. So there was one medium bright star near the moon. Um, I didn't ID it, but there it is. And I pulled over to here. This is pretty high in the sky. The moon was still pretty high in the sky as I shot this. And I went over to this star to do the focus tests. And you'll see why in a second here. But something very strange happened uh, on this night. So normally you would get a donut. Look what's going on here. It's cut in half. It almost seems like something is in the way but it's too far off the horizon to be in the way. And in a minute here, there's a very dim star to the upper left of this star, and I will overexpose the image to the point where you can see both stars, and as I defocus or overfocus, they both uh, give that half circle look, and I have no idea what's going on. Uh, there should be a full circle, like you just saw with Jupiter or any other star, and yet for some reason this is being cut in half. So I spent, I don't know, well over an hour shooting this, messing around with it, and here you can really start to tell the pattern that you get. It looks like you're looking through a swimming pool that has a pool light that's been where the water's been disturbed. That's the pattern you get. Um, I've been seeing some people do this with Venus, which works really well if you're under magnification. And again, this is not under magnification. Um, when I get my IP system going, this will be four or five hundred times magnified. Right now, the only magnification is just because I'm using the scope as a big lens. Here in a minute, I'm going to overexpose the whole image a lot so that we can see the dim star to the upper left. And you'll notice that even that star to the upper left of the star, here I go. You'll, you got to look carefully to the upper left, um, not quite center, center frame, a little left of center frame. You can detect a little dim star there, and it also is giving a half circle, and I have no idea why. Um, I even pulled the the uh, the T ring, the camera part. Uh, I checked everything. I have no idea why this is going on. Strange. I've never seen it before. Whenever you defocus or overfocus something, there's the defocus. So you can see that it's spun underneath now when I defocus. When I overfocus, like I'm doing here, it's on top. So I was doing tests where I was right there at the, the pivot point. Okay, here it is with an edit zoom of about four or five hundred times, and I'll do a couple more. That's overfocus. And you can really start to get the sense of the liquid pattern that you can see. And there's defocus when the ring spins to the bottom. But it's the strangest thing. It acts like there is a physical object in front of the, or 
like covering the bottom of the scope, but that's just not the case. Of course, I'll be doing this every night I'm out shooting. I'll pick an object to do this test with, and when I get the eyepieces out, it'll really be something to see. Anyhow, I'm going to let this run out. Oh, yeah, um, a lunar wave or a potential lunar wave was filmed, and it is a damn good one. It is not the moon in full frame. Uh, it's a close-up shot, but it rivals the 2012 footage once it is vetted and we confirm that it is, in fact, a lunar wave. Um, I don't want to announce it. I want to wait for the permission of the person who shot it because if I say something here, he'll get barraged. He probably will anyhow. But um, we're going to have a, a Lunar Wave Roundtable with Jason from Secrets of Saturn is going to moderate that. And we're going to have three of us that have shot the Lunar Wave. And uh, I'm sure it'll come up then. And hopefully I'll be able to run that footage at some point here and maybe help vet it. So there it is. Cheers.